Good morning, Christ Fellowship. Good morning. I figured it gives me another inch or two, this thing right here. Well, welcome to church this morning. It's great to assemble as God's people and praise our God. Uh, it, is, it is good news that Jesus is king today, and he is sovereign over all. And we get the privilege of worshiping him today. A few are visiting with us for the first time. Uh, we are very glad that you are here, and uh, it would be our privilege to get to know you a little bit better after the service. So if you have a few moments, please uh, stop by. Uh, right outside the front entrance, we're going to have a guest greeter uh, who is going to be answering any questions you may have about Christ Fellowship Church, uh, and who would be uh, willing to uh, reach out to you, maybe get your email address. We can keep you in the loop with different events that are going on at our church, uh, and again, help point you in the right direction if you are interested in learning more about our church. Uh, tonight, we are having another youth gathering from 5 to 7 p.m., so any, um, anyone ages 10 to 18 uh, are welcome to come. We're going to have a Bible lesson, uh, pizza, which is always good, and some fellowship and fun games as well. Uh, we have Stephen Doan teaching our lesson tonight. Uh, Stephen is a phenomenal teacher, always does a great job, so we will... Um, be treated well tonight. Again, that's from 5 to 7 uh, here at the church. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to see uh, Peter or myself after the service. Uh, Vision Virginia offering, by God's grace, our church raised a total of $2,592 for the Vision Virginia uh, SBCV offering. I think it's appropriate to clap. A hundred percent of those funds, again, go to support church planning, church revitalization, evangelism, uh, and other ministry initiatives in Virginia and Washington, D.C. So praise the Lord for his uh, kindness to us, and thank you for your generosity in supporting that ministry. At this time, let's take a few moments to quiet our hearts and seek the Lord's blessing on our service. A moment I will read uh, from Psalm 127 and then open us up in prayer. Let's quiet our hearts. This is Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build, build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we come to you this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, we, we pray in his name because we know that he is the only one who is worthy. Now, Lord, in ourselves, we are not worthy that you should hear our prayers, much less answer them. But, Lord, we pray uh, on his, um, in his behalf and, and by his name. And we know that because of that, you hear our prayers, Lord, and you delight to answer them because you are our heavenly Father. We thank you, God, for the opportunity we have this morning to come together and worship you, to lift you high and exalt you. We pray, Lord, that in all things we would do just that, Lord, in our fellowship, in our singing, in our hearing of your word, uh, Lord, and much more than that, in our day-to-day -day lives, that we would be perpetually glorifying and worshiping you. Father, this is the, the desire of our heart, and Father, as we live in this uh, corrupt and sinful world, we know that uh, it is often frustrating to live in this way, and we confess, Lord, this morning that we are um, often fall short of your glory. We fall short of your perfect standards, and so, Lord, we confess our sins to you, sins of pride, of lust, of envy, of fear, of unbelief. Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us and cleanse us by the blood of Christ, and we thank you that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and so we come before you not timidly, but confidently, knowing that you've received us and welcomed us and that we are your children forever. And you will not let um, anything pluck us out of your hand. You will 
preserve us to the end. We thank you, God, for that great hope. Lord, as we sing songs of praise, would your truth um, be filling our minds? May truth be motivating our songs of praise. Um, And Lord, be lifted high. We we pray for Peter. Did you fill him with your spirit uh, as he preaches your word from Ephesians chapter 6? Lord, and that you'd open up our eyes to what you'd have for us to learn this morning. And I pray particularly for the young people and uh, children, those under their parents' authority now. Father, that we would be... uh, marked by an obedience, a lifestyle of obedience to the authorities, the parental authorities you've set above us. Father, that we would know that in doing this, we are honoring you. Uh, Father, that we would not think like this culture uh, shouts for us to think, that we can find some false sense of independence in shunning our parents' authority, but rather, God, that we would joyfully submit and joyfully obey, knowing that that's where freedom is found. Father, help us and we know that you will. Lord, be glorified now as we praise you in song. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, what a joy to gather together and to be able to sing songs of praise to our God. We're going to sing three songs this morning that, that call on us to bless the Lord, to praise his name, and specifically to praise his name for his love and for his holiness. So let's stand together. We're going to sing 10,000 Reasons. We're going to sing How Deep the Father's Love for Us and Holy, Holy, Holy.
sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Shall rise. 
be seated. Our pastor Ron Stoll is going to come and lead us in a time of pastoral prayer. Uh, before we do uh, begin joining together in prayer, uh, our brother Kyle Lane has some information that he would like to share with the church. So those of you who might know me, um, I have a significant other named Natalie Shea. Uh, we are engaged, and uh, we're actually getting married in exactly 20 days. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we actually met online uh, last this past December, so um, everything's been going great. God has tested me in so many ways. Uh, I can't even begin to count it. We've done premarital counseling, and uh, he's just been growing me in this whole experience. So um, we would just really ask for prayer for, um, you know, that the service and everything would go well, that, uh, you know, COVID doesn't interrupt what it's already, you know, already interrupted. Um, uh, Virginia recently got taken off the Cuomo's list, so I don't have to quarantine when I go up there, but I would just like for prayer that uh, that doesn't change, that we don't get put back on the list, because um, I'm going up there the Wednesday of that week. On the, um, We're getting married on the 24th, so just prayer for that, and uh, prayer that I would just become a, a great husband um, and... Uh, just a good leader for uh, for our family. And that's about it. Thank you. Kyle looks uh, pretty calm for just 20 days, doesn't he? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's rejoice in that. And please uh, join together with me now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, only thou art holy. There is none beside thee, perfect in power, love, and purity. These are not just poetic words we sing. This is the wondrous truth about who you are, our creator, our God, the only source of real hope and life and joy and purpose. In your holiness, you, in the beginning, created the whole universe with all the stars and planets and mysteries well beyond even what we might try to imagine. And in your holiness, you created the earth and filled it with all sorts of plants and animals and wonders. And then you created man. And you made man in your image and provided for him a wonderful place. And you brought before man every beast of the field and every bird of heaven that you created. But even with all that you had given him, you knew that this first man was not complete. For he was alone without a suitable companion. So in your holiness, you created for him another. And not just another man. Because you wanted for him more than just companionship, you wanted for him a perfect complement. So you created woman. And for the man and woman, you created the marriage relationship. One man, one woman. One bond for life. For those called into marriage, you created the relationship to bring man and woman to completeness and to be a reflection of the love Christ himself has for his people, the church. And in keeping with your desire for marriage, your word instructs husbands to sacrificially love their wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And in keeping with your design for marriage, your word instructs wives to sacrificially love their husbands in return. 
But while we do understand that our marriages will be most joyful and fulfilling when we are walking in obedience to you in loving our spouses, we do confess that we so often struggle in this because of our own selfishness and worldliness. And so we pray this morning for all the marriages, present and future, represented here today. We pray for your grace to enable us to live in a manner that brings you glory through our marriages. And we also praise you and rejoice with Kyle and Natalie for the plans that you have for them. We pray you will bless each of them in their walk with you, in their relationship, and in the relationship with each other during uh, this remaining time of their engagement. And we pray for each of them in the plans that you have for them being united together in marriage, a relationship, again, designed to bring you uh, glory and to bring completeness in their lives and to reflect Christ's love for the church. We do pray uh, for... Uh, the marriage service coming up in uh, just 20 days uh, and the complications with COVID. We just pray that things would go well and, and that time would, would just be a special time for Kyle and Natalie and also be a time that would bring glory to you and again, uh, uniting together like this. We also pray uh, this morning for our church. Uh, we praise you so much for sustaining us through this very unusual time of COVID-19, of the mask and the isolations and the precautions. But even so, you have blessed our church in so many ways, and we thank you for that during this time. We pray for our federal, state, and local leaders. We pray for their salvation. We pray that they would lead in a manner honoring to you. And we pray for our president. Uh, this morning, President Trump and the First Lady, who both have been uh, tested positive for the virus. We pray that their symptoms would be light, and we would pray for a full and speedy recovery for them, and, and we pray for them as leaders of our nation. And we pray for the upcoming election. We pray that whoever you put into office, that they would lead in a manner that brings glory to you, and we pray for uh, the time coming up to the election, which, um, if it holds true to what we've seen in the past months, could be a time of tension and unrest and, uh, and dispute. So we just pray that you would uh, lead this time as well, and we would, um, we would see your glory in how all this unfolds for us. No, Lord, we know that you have... Uh, our church and our nation in, in your best interest, and we just ask for your continued care upon us. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have just one question for Kyle. Are you going to stay up there, or is she coming back here? Back here. Amen. All right, it's even better. Now we can really celebrate that. We are very happy, brother, to celebrate with you. And my Bible van. No, there it is. Bible, book, sermon. Yes. <laughs> we can proceed. Please take your uh, copy of God's Word and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. This morning, as we continue to look at this wonderful letter together, we're going to be looking at the first four verses together. And when you have Ephesians 6, please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as we listen to God's instruction for the home, for children and for parents. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 4 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is God's word for us this morning. Please be seated as we think together about uh, the home, and in particular, the Christian home, which should be distinct. It should be different than other homes because there's a power at work in Christian homes that is absent from other homes. 
and because we have God's wisdom for the home in terms of what our home should look like. Now, parenting, uh, if you've done it, you know it's a challenge. Many people say that parenting is marked by long days and short years, and especially when our kids are younger, we feel the strain of that. As fathers and mothers, we often give ourselves all day long in order to instruct and encourage and to correct our children. It's very common for us at the end of the day to just kind of fall into bed, just collapse into bed because we're utterly exhausted uh, over the busyness of the day. I call these the tired years, but while I'm not quite in this phase to come, I understand as children get older, it doesn't necessarily get easier. And there's a different kind of tiredness that comes as the physical kind of needs of children diminish, the emotional needs kind of ramp up. And that can be its own unique struggle. So parenting is certainly a demanding task. But while parenting is a demanding task, it's also a great blessing. It's a great privilege. It's a great responsibility. Our children have been entrusted to us by God. They do not belong to us. Parents, we need to remember this. Our children do not belong to us. Our children belong to God. And they've been entrusted to us for their own good, for their spiritual well-being. You see, each child is an immortal soul with an eternal destiny. And to put it starkly, our children must one day live forever in heaven, or they must one day live forever in hell. And God has given those children to us so that we could point them towards heaven, so that we could love them, so that we could teach them about Jesus and about his great love for broken people like us, so that they might find true life in him. And that's the great end, brothers and sisters, of parenting, is that we would point our children towards Jesus. We're going to see that This morning, it's an awesome task. It's an awesome responsibility. So how are we to accomplish this task? Well, God's Word speaks so clearly. All throughout the Bible, actually, we get insights into parenting, but this passage in particular is one of the most helpful as it lays out for us God's wisdom for the home, how we're supposed to organize our homes. In particular, this passage, it it speaks to children, and it teaches them about their primary responsibility, and it speaks to fathers, and not just fathers, though, to parents, about what their responsibility is. And as we, by God's grace, fulfill the responsibilities that the Lord has given us, we can live in homes that are shaped by the gospel. And that's our desire this morning, that our homes would be distinct, that they would be light-filled, that they would be joy-filled, because they are shaped in every way by the truth of Jesus Christ and the gospel of his salvation. So we're looking at this book. This is a book that in many ways is about the salvation that we've received in Christ. It's kind of God's big picture of his plan for all of history. Paul lays that out in the first three chapters, and then in the final three chapters, he's kind of unpacking what that means, kind of the so what of this book. What does it mean for us? And we are particularly, in this part of the book, we're unpacking how it is that believers are supposed to live as children of God. So God is our Father. We're to bear the family image. What does that look like? Well, Paul's unpacked for us most recently what that looks like in terms of our relationships and marriage, the role of the husband, the role of the wife. And we've seen something of the marvelous balance that there is in marriage, that each one in the marriage relationship doesn't get to live for himself or herself, but must ultimately die to self for the sake of the other. And then there's this beautiful balance that God works out. And the gospel is portrayed as the husband and the wife fulfill the roles that God has given to them. So God's wisdom for marriage is wonderful. And I trust we're going to see this morning as we look at Ephesians 6 that God's wisdom for parenting is wonderful as well. He speaks to every area of life. So here we're in another transition. Paul first talking about marriage, now he's talking about parenting, parents and children, giving children the responsibility to obey and to honor their parents, giving parents, and fathers in particular, the responsibility to tenderly disciple their children. So we're going to study this passage using two points this morning. First point, children are to obey their parents. We'll see that in verses 1 to 3. And then the second point, parents are to tenderly disciple their children. And we'll see that when we look at verse 4. So let's look at that first point together this morning. Children are to obey their parents. Look at your copy of God's Word, verses 1 to 3. Children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. 
So here Paul, he begins his instructions to the home, and he begins with the children, and he gives them their most basic command. The most basic commandment that God gives to children through the Apostle Paul is this, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now that word children there, it doesn't you know, speak only of little, little children. It actually refers to all children of whatever age, children who are in the home under the authority of their parents. So we're talking about little children and boys and girls, and we're talking about teenagers as well. And the word obey there, in the, in the original language, it has the idea of hearing under. We're hearing under. So the idea is that children are to hear the instructions of their parents, and then they are to actively respond to those instructions. They are to obey. They are to follow the commands that they are given. And as you read through the Bible, you see that the scope of this command is absolutely sweeping. So Colossians chapter 3 tells us that children are to obey their parents in everything. Nothing left out. And in Ephesians 6, 1, the command is only limited in one way. The obedience must be done in the Lord. What does that mean? Well, commentators have different opinions about what it means that children are to obey in the Lord, but I agree with those commentators that understand it to mean that the obedience of the children to the parents must be regulated by their primary obedience, which is to the Lord. So in the same way, just as we are commanded to obey the leaders that God has placed over us, as long as they don't tell us to disobey God, in the same way, children are to obey everything their parents command them unless their parents are commanding them to sin. It's a very large command. It's a very sweeping command. And yet children ultimately belong to God, and they must remember that. Now, in the second part of verse 1, Paul gives the reason why children should obey their parents. He says, for this is right. Now, that that doesn't so much mean, and it does mean this. It means because it's fitting, because it's proper. This indeed is God's design. But that word right there, it's related to a Greek word that, that is often translated righteousness. And the idea is that this is what God has commanded. This is what God wants, and he's commanded it in the law of God. This is righteous in God's eyes for children to follow his command. And what's the command? Well, you see it in verses 2 and 3, where Paul points back to the Ten Commandments. And he he points back to uh, the command that has been given in the Ten Commandments, that children would obey their parents. That's the fifth commandment. And he specifically points us to the way it's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 5. So listen to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 16. Here's God's command to children. So you see it it follows all the way through. His plan's the same. He says, Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. But I want you to notice in the second part of verse 2 that Paul adds something here. He makes an observation about this commandment. This commandment is unique. He says this is the first commandment with a, a promise. So this commandment uniquely contains a promise of God that for those who follow it, there will be blessing on their life. There will be long life given to them. That's what Paul says in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 3, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now, ancient Israelites, hearing this promise, they would... They would have been sitting on on the the shore of the Jordan River getting ready to go into the promised land, and they would have understood God to be saying that if we honor our father and mother, God is going to bless us and and prosper us in the land, and he's going to allow us to live a long life, a profitable life there in that land. But now notice in Ephesians, Paul is addressing a different audience. Uh, He is speaking to those who are mostly Gentiles, so they're not Jews. This isn't Israel. This is Asia Minor. We think of this as modern-day Turkey. And Paul is still applying this same promise to them. Now, there's more we could say about this, but what it means is that this promise of blessing is still valid, that God still has a particular intention for children that they would honor their parents, and in honoring their parents, they would be blessed. Now, some critics here kind of quibble and point out, well, you know, many children honor their parents, but they don't live to be 80 years old. They die early. But I don't think that's really Paul's point here. I think what Paul is doing here is he is pointing children towards the path of blessing. He's saying, if you will honor your parents in the Lord, you're walking in the path of blessing. It will be blessed in this life, and you'll be blessed with eternal life. And that is long life indeed. The Lord God wants our children to be blessed. Children, listen, the Lord God wants you to be blessed. And he tells you that the path of blessing is that you would obey and you would honor your parents. So do you want God's blessing on your life, young people? At this point in your life, it looks like listening to what your father and mother tell you, 
hearing it, submitting to it, and obeying it from a heart that honors your parents. Now, at this point, I want to make three observations from this passage, and specifically, I want to speak to children and young people. I want to talk to you this morning about what God's Word has to say to you this morning from this passage. And here's the thing, I want you to listen, because God's speaking to you this morning, and He wants you to hear His Word. The first observation we want to make is that God commands you to obey your parents. Little ones, boys, girls, teenagers, those living in your parents' home, God commands you to obey your parents. Now, the challenge is you're being brought up in a culture that will be continually telling you that the good and right thing for you to do is to do what you want to do. And you're going to see television program after television program and movie after movie, and it's going to portray your father as stupid. It's going to portray the the mother as loud, aggressive, kind of over the top. And it's going to portray the children as wise and competent, you know, able to make their own decisions, maybe a little snarky, right? Maybe able to, you know, crack some jokes against their parents who need so much help. The problem is you're being lied to. The movies and the television program are telling you that you are young and you're wise and you're competent and you're able to make all the decisions for yourself. But here's the thing. None of us are competent in and of ourselves. And particularly when we're young, God has put your parents in your life because he wants them to speak wisdom into your life. He wants them to help you. You see, they're given to you as a gift to guide you, to teach you, to instruct you so that you can walk in a path that really is blessed. God wants your parents to help you grow and mature. And so he expects you to listen to your parents and he expects you to obey them. He expects you to do what they say, and in that, you will be blessed. But here's another thing we need to say about this. Obeying your parents involves more than just outward actions. So God is not simply interested in you just obeying what your parents say. He's actually far more interested in your heart. And that's why he points you, young ones, to the fifth commandment, where it talks about this idea of honoring your father and mother. That word honor, it speaks of respect. It speaks of esteem. The idea is that there's love there, that you're listening to your parents and you're obeying your parents, but you're not doing that just because you have to, just because they're bigger than you. No, you're doing that because you honor them, because you love them, because you esteem them, and because you want to please God who has commanded you to respond in that way. So here's the thing. You can do everything your parents command you in a day, but if you don't do it with a heart that's right towards your parents, you're not obeying. You can do every single command you're given, but if you're doing it with an angry attitude or if you're frustrated or if you're talking back the whole time, you see you're not obeying at all. That's not obedience in God's eyes. It's actually disobedience. You may be standing up when they say stand up, but you're sitting down on the inside as it's been put. And that's disobedience. So now sometimes when I was a child, my parents are here this morning. I didn't know they'd be here this morning, but they can attest to this, (laughs) right? When I was a child, I would obey my parents but my heart was often angry. And I had, a lot of, I had a lot of things to tell my parents when they asked me to do things. And I had, I had knowledge in terms of how I should be doing things better and wiser and more quickly. And it didn't take long for me to be frustrated, angry, to kind of clench my jaw. You know, particularly teenagers have a tendency to think that we understand the world better than parents. Uh, I was like that. And so I've spent many a year talking back to my parents, and I might have done what they asked me to do, but here's the thing. According to the Bible, it wasn't obedience at all. It was disobedience. I was sinning against my parents. I was failing to honor my parents. Perhaps you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps you've experienced something like that in your own life. Well, that's not what God desires from children. God is after this love-based, honor-filled obedience. Maybe you've heard the phrase, first time, right away with a happy heart. That's kind of a good summary of what God wants. He wants first time, right away. He wants a happy heart as we listen to our parents and obey them. Here's the problem. None of us have ever perfectly obeyed our parents. Sitting here this morning, whether we are two or 92, none of us have fulfilled this command perfectly. No, children, here, you'd have to listen to this. There's a reason why it's hard for you to obey your parents. It's because you're just like us. It's because you're sinful just like we are. It's because you have the same heart problem that we have, that instead of wanting to honor God and love your parents and obey your parents, there's this sin within you just as there's this sin within us that makes us want to kind of push back against their authority. The problem with our obedience isn't the commands of our parents. The problem of our obedience is our heart. So what should you do? 
here's what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just resolve to try harder. The last thing I want you to do this morning, children, is just, you know, just try harder. I'm just going to do it on my own. I'm just going to be a better kid. I'm just going to work harder. There's nothing wrong with hard work. There's nothing wrong with a resolve to want to honor your parents. Nothing's wrong with that. What's wrong, and particularly, listen, child, if you're born again, if you really have a relationship with God, what's wrong with trying to do it on your own is that you can't. You've got to learn the same lesson that we have to learn as we continue to walk with Jesus, that the only way you're going to be able to obey your parents in the way God wants you to obey your parents is if you will submit yourself to Jesus and ask for his help. That if you'll start the day with him and you'll pray for his grace and you'll ask him to fill you with his strength. And in that way, you will have the Holy Spirit of God within you to help you respond well and honor well with your words and with your actions. But, but children, listen, if you're not born again, if you're not a Christian, what you need is a new heart. You know, that's the whole message of the Bible is that we were born and we weren't born the way we should have been. We were actually born separated from God. And so from our earliest moments, we don't love God and love others. Instead, our hearts are kind of turned in on themselves. And there's this fundamental selfishness that marks us, and that's what sin does to us. We were created to love God and to love others. That was God's design for our life. But no, sin takes us, and it kind of breaks us, and it kind of molds us into into little images of our own self, and we set ourselves up as the God of our own life. And that's why some of the first words that even precious little children speak are me and mine and give me. And no. And you know, parents don't have to teach them to do that. No, you see, you see, child, children, this comes from your heart, just as it comes from our heart. The good news for you this morning is that there's a way to have a new heart. And the way to have a new heart is not by, I'm going to try to be better. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to be a nice Christian-y person. That's not the way. The way is to understand that God has provided a Savior for your sins even now. It doesn't matter if you're five, two, 14, God has provided a Savior. His name is Jesus. He came in obedience to his Father, and he perfectly lived in this world. He always obeyed the commandments of his Father. He always honored his Father with all of his heart. He loved others perfectly. He did perfectly what all of us have failed to do. And you know what? He came here to do it so that we might be saved, so that you might be saved. And he died on the cross as a sacrifice for sinners. On the cross, he bore in himself the wrath of God against the sins of all who will turn from their sins to trust in him. And children, listen, maybe this morning is the morning that you need to trust in Jesus. Maybe this morning is the morning that you need, to, you need to listen to God speaking to you and say, listen, you'll never be good enough because you're broken like we are, but Jesus is good enough, and God wants you to trust in him. God wants you to put your trust in him. You see, Jesus died, but he rose from the dead. And now the message of the gospel, the good news that we have to share with you is this. Uh, Young ones, if you will turn from your sin this morning and you'll put your trust in Jesus, your relationship with God will be restored and he'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a heart that's like Jesus's. He'll put his spirit within you so that you can begin to obey and honor your parents from the heart in the way God has called you. See, Jesus wants to help you do these things. He doesn't want you to clean yourself up. He doesn't want you to try to be a, a nicer person. You see, obedience to our parents begins by trusting in Jesus. That's where it begins. Well, if you have questions about that, what would it mean for you to trust in Jesus? I hope, I hope you'll turn to your parents this afternoon and you'll ask them, what does that mean? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And let them talk with you about him. I know your parents would have a great desire to do that this morning. There's one more thing I want to say to you. Young ones, listen, when you offer honor-filled obedience to your parents, you are honoring God who gave you your parents. You see, you have a higher motivation than just trying to make your parents happy. Some children, they just spend their entire child, they're just wired this way. They just want to make people happy, and they want to make their parents happy. And they try so hard to make their parents happy, but, but they're living so far below what God calls them to because ultimately our desire is to be pleasing to God. And the way that you, young one, can be pleasing to God this morning is by first trusting in Jesus and two, by honoring your parents from the heart because you love God, because you love Jesus, because you want to do what God has commanded you to do this morning. So when you love your parents, when you obey your parents with honor filled obedience, you are obeying God who gave you your parents and that honors God. And again, it begins by trusting in Jesus. I'm going to say one more word to you young people, and I want you to listen this morning. You must be born again. Your parents' faith will not save you. 
If your parents love Jesus, that's not enough. You must love Jesus. You must turn from your sins. You must ask him to save you. And just know that he's kind and that he welcomes children to himself. So trust in him today. Trust in him this morning. Be saved today. You'll know great joy in that. And we'll know great joy in that as well. Well, let me just kind of looking at verses one to three, let me say a word to parents now. Let me give you kind of two applications for how we should apply this to our hearts as parents. First, we must teach our children to obey. We have to teach them this. God has given our children to us so that we can disciple them. We're going to talk about that. But part of that discipleship is teaching them how to obey. So our children need help to learn how to obey the command that they've been given in verses 1 to 3. So when we become parents, we become aware of sin in a new way, right? Because at first you have this adorable little thing that the hospital foolishly gives to you and lets you take home, and it's cute. And it's adorable and has big eyes and it, you know, it, it makes all kinds of cute sounds. But then it doesn't take long before you realize that this little thing is profoundly sinful. <laughs> that its heart is hard. That it demands what it wants with all that it has. That it fights as hard as it can to get all that it can acquire. Again, mine and me and no are words that characterize little ones and hitting and stealing do as well. And they do those things naturally. Do you know what they don't do naturally? They don't obey. You see, they need instruction. They need parents who love them enough to point them towards God's standard for them. That God's standard for them is that they would listen to their parents, that they would do what their parents say. If we're going to love our children and lead them to Jesus, we must teach them to obey. And here's a, here's a gospel motivation for teaching your children to obey as they fail, and they will, yeah, they'll begin to see that they need something more than themselves, that they need Jesus. And no, we need to keep pointing them towards Jesus. And here's the thing, parents, God's word gives us no option because children are not competent to disciple themselves. Children are not competent to train themselves any more than we were when we were children. So they're not mentally you know, mature enough. They're not emotionally mature enough for that burden, just as we weren't when we were their age. Here's what we can't do. We cannot throw up our hands in exasperation when we find out that this is hard, because it is hard. It's a very difficult thing to kind of watch a child yelling at the parent and watching the parent kind of pleading with the child or bribing the child or threatening the child. It's a bit of a tragedy as you watch the child just kind of lead the parent around, right? And here's the thing, all of us parents, to one degree or another, we have engaged in just that tragedy. But that's not what we're called to as parents. We're called to teach our children obedience, not by bribery, not by threatenings, not by by physical force. No, we're called to teach them to obey from the heart. And that takes work. It takes effort. It's hard Right? When we're teaching them obedience, we have to require that they listen to our commands. And that's hard. It's difficult. And I struggle with it. And so pray for me in that, even as I pray for you parents in that. But we are not loving our children if we are not teaching them to follow our commands. Their entire lives are going to be under authority. And if they don't learn early that they're under authority, well, it's going to be harder for them. Here's a, perhaps, I think, definitely more more uh, crucial application. We must work and pray for the salvation of our children. Yeah, we must work and pray for the salvation of our children. Even if we teach our children obedience, we have to. We need to remember that the end goal for the Christian parent is not that our children would be educated or nice or responsible. You know, we're not looking just to raise citizens that are, you know, exemplary citizens. Our goal is not outward behavior. We are not striving to raise Pharisees who are morally upright and abhorrent to God. We're after their hearts. You see, we want our children to know Jesus, and we want them, they want, we want them to love Jesus. So we have to speak with them. Here's the thing. We can't force them to believe. We can't save them. But what we can do is a pattern of our parenting is this day by day by day, we can point them to Jesus. And sometimes that's going to look like family devotions. And sometimes that's going to look like correction. And sometimes pointing them to Jesus is going to look like coming to them and repenting for our sin and saying, you know what? Your dad just sinned against you and it was wrong. Forgive me for that. Your daddy needs Jesus. Can you pray for me? And let them pray for you. 
let, and point them to Jesus in that way. Some of, the, some of the best things we can do as parents for our children is just to repent well before them and point them to Jesus in that way. Well, it's a big, it's a big task, right? Parents, you think about this weight, and if you're at the beginning of the journey, it might be overwhelming. Let me just give you some encouragement. God is with you. He has not forsaken you, and God is with you and giving you wisdom as well. And that's what we see next in the second point. Parents are to tenderly disciple their children. So look at verse 4. Paul continues, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So here Paul directly addresses fathers, and he begins to give them God's wisdom for the home. And I think it's significant that he says fathers, because fathers bear the ultimate responsibility for the home. What happens in the home ultimately comes back to the father. So men, listen, the buck stops with us as it relates to our homes. And it's important that we remember that. It's important that we take that responsibility seriously. At the same time, this this Greek word for fathers there, it sometimes refers to both fathers and mothers. And it is possible that Paul's actually speaking to parents here, that he's addressing both fathers and mothers. That's certainly possible. And so here's the thing, as we talk about this passage this morning, I'm not only talking to the fathers, I'm talking to the mothers as well, because the mothers have the same responsibility as the fathers. Mothers must also follow these commands. Like fathers, mothers must avoid provoking their children to anger, and they must also bring up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So we're going to talk to fathers this morning, but I want you to hear parents. And mothers, I don't want you to check out. I want you to listen to God's wisdom for you as well. Look at verse 4. Here you said Paul gives, gives fathers, parents, two commands. And you'll notice that the first command is negative, and then the second command is positive. The negative command is this, do not provoke your children to anger. And the positive command is, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And just, again, as you're studying through Paul's epistles in particular, notice how many times he's, he begins with a negative and then he gives you the opposite. Don't do this, but do this. It's just part of God giving this this full, whole orb understanding of how we're supposed to live. Well, let's look at these commands. Look at the negative command first. Do not provoke your children to anger. Here's what he's saying most especially. Fathers, you have to care about the emotional lives of your children. You have to care about your children's emotions. Me too. And in particular, we need to care about how our actions affect the emotional lives of our children because we can parent in such a way that we can build up in them bitterness and resentment if we're not careful here. And Paul says that's what we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to be fathers in such a way as lead our children to a deep-seated anger and resentment towards us. That can happen. We don't want that to happen. We want to avoid that. In his commentary in this passage, John MacArthur gave some really helpful insights in terms of the ways that, that fathers or parents can do this, can kind of build up anger and resentment in their children. And I, I found this helpful, and I wanted to share this with you this morning. Just several different ways that we can lead our children to anger and bitterness if we're not careful. The first is well-meaning overprotection. Well-meaning overprotection. What I mean by this is some parents, they just smother their children. They're constantly guarding them. They're constantly challenging them. They're overly strict with them. You see, ultimately, they don't trust their children. They don't trust their children to do things, and so they never let their children do anything, and they're always there to kind of keep them back from doing things. You see, these parents forget that their children are individuals, who must grow up and learn to make decisions on their own. Parents need to remember that. Parents also, within measure, I think this is important, particularly as your children get older, we must learn to let our children make mistakes. You know, within measure, we want to be guiding, but listen, we have to be willing just to step back and let God parent as well. And even if they make mistakes, we can be there to encourage them and to pray for them and to pray that they'd learn good lessons. But it's part of letting our children grow up and be responsible adults is that we give them the freedom to do that. The second way we can fall into this error is favoritism. So if you know the, the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors, right? We've all kind of experienced this. The parents, they just kind of pick out one kid, and that one kid can do no wrong. And here's the thing about children. They're smart. And they can tell when mommy and daddy love Johnny more than the rest of them. And that works up bitterness in them. And that works up anger and resentment in them. So a question like, why can't you be more like your brother or sister? It's not really a helpful question to ask our children. Because it's not about asking them to compare themselves with their brother or sister. You're pointing them towards Jesus, even as you're pointing their brother and sister towards Jesus. 
There's a third way we do this, pushing achievement beyond reasonable bounds. Some parents simply just demand too much of their children. You know, sometimes it's because they're reliving their lives through their children, right? You know, I messed up, but hey, you're not going to mess up. In fact, you're going to be the best ever, and I'm going to push you until you do that. Sometimes it's because we make idols of our children, right? We find our identity. We find our purpose. We find our meaning, and somehow I have to make this child turn out to be amazing because then that makes me amazing. And the problem with that is, well, we crush our children, and an idol will never make you happy. An idol will never do enough for you, and your child will never, ever be able to kind of bear the weight that you're putting on him or her if they have to be your meaning and your identity and your purpose in life. You will crush them, and they will either resent it or they may be destroyed by it. Another way we can do this is by discouragement. So sometimes parents, they just speak to a child, and the child can just never seem to do anything right. So you just criticize, continually criticize. The child constantly hurts. I didn't do this right. You didn't do this right. You didn't do this right. You should do better at this. Why aren't you doing this? The child never hears, great job, buddy. You did. You were amazing. Look at the way God blessed you to be able to do that. I really appreciated how you handled that. Way to talk to your mom. The child never hears these affirmations of love and affection and esteem. The child only ever hears, not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough, not enough. And it doesn't take long for the child to be wounded. And sometimes, tragically, these children grow up to be parents who do the same thing for their children because, after all, it's the only pattern of parenting they've ever seen. It's a tragic cycle. We need to avoid it. Another is failing to sacrifice for children and making them feel unwanted. Some parents act as if their children are obstacles to their happiness. The children are just always in the way. Stop. Leave me alone. I'm busy. I don't want to deal with you right now. I'm doing this. Parents give into a lifestyle of selfishness, and the children learn very, very quickly that they're not as important as this or that thing that mom or dad are focused on right now. It's a hard thing for children to understand that they are not particularly important to their parents. And eventually the children resent it or they follow the same pattern of selfishness and they just leave the parents behind and they go out into the world and they live very selfish and self-focused lives just in the way that they saw their parents live. Another one is using love as as a tool for reward or punishment. So when the child does right, well, the child gets affection. But when the child messes up, coldness. The relationship is broken. And there's a period where the child will feel nothing but coldness until the child begins to live back up to the standards of the parent. And so you see the love in this home is not unconditional. The love in this home is quite conditional. And it's really kind of a cruel form of emotional abuse. And it happens all the time. Children feel this. Another, of course, is physical and verbal abuse. You know, sadly, even in Christian homes, perhaps... um, and we, pr- we trust not, we pray not, but let me just encourage you, Christ Fellowship, there's no room for it here. In Christian homes, physical and verbal abuse. Parents are just simply bigger than their children. Sometimes it's easier just to make your child do what you want the child to do. And yeah, and Satan can be at work in a home so that the children are bullied and intimidated. Of course, this abuse can be subtle as well, especially when we're talking about verbal abuse. Some parents just seem to kind of like sarcastically cutting their children down. I've seen it happen where children just get cut down and cut down and the child's sitting right here and the parent's just kind of mocking the child and this little child can do absolutely nothing about it. And of course, it's easy for us as parents to criticize and be sarcastic with our children because our children's verbal ability, it hasn't actually matured yet. So they don't have a prayer of keeping up with our wit. It's just abuse. It's just ugly. And it shouldn't be in a Christian home. And eventually, children become embittered by it. This last one, disciplining in anger. This is related to the last, but it's possible to discipline your children in anger without physically abusing them. But your children know. And you know what? My children know because they're smart. And they can see when our hearts are not what they should be, when we are disciplining them. They can see when we are angry in a way that we should not be. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. I found it very convicting. He said, um, he said this on this point. When you're disciplining a child, you should have first controlled yourself. What right have you to say to your child that he needs discipline when you obviously need it yourself? Self-control, the control of temper, is an essential prerequisite in the control of others. 
So many ways to go wrong in parenting, right? So what should we take away from this? Well, we should take away from this. Here's the application. The application is simply this. God's command to love your neighbor as yourself, it applies to your children. Right? It applies to our children. How do we want to be treated? How do we want to be spoken to? Well, that's the way we should treat, and that's the way we should speak to our children. Yeah, because there's so many ways we can go wrong in parenting. We should be praying for the Spirit of God to help us to love and nurture and invest in and disciple our children in a way that is pleasing to Him. We should be, listen, Christ Fellowship, this should be a church that is marked by speaking life into other people's lives. We all hear far too much criticism. We can accomplish 80% of what we want to see accomplished in people's lives by just encouraging them. And then you've got this 20% where you really have to say, hey, you know what? You need to change this. You need to deal with this. But we should be speaking life into one another's lives. And parents, we should be speaking life into our children. They should routinely be smiling when we're done talking with them because they know, you know what? Mommy and daddy love me. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, there's a second command that Paul gives fathers, parents in this passage. Look at that second command in the second part of verse 4. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this positive command Paul gives to the parents, the the word there, bring them up, it actually comes from a Greek word that actually originally spoke of of, uh, nurturing or nourishing something. You know, it conveys the idea of gentleness, of forbearance, of providing for. John Calvin, uh, he kind of translated it this way, let children be fondly cherished. I think that's helpful. Let children be fondly cherished. And then Paul gives two ways to do that. How do we bring up our children? Well, we bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That word discipline, it speaks of kind of the overall training of the child. And it includes times when there needs to be correction and punishment because sometimes our children need to be corrected and they need to be punished when they're doing wrong. That's part of the discipline that children need. And then this word training, it speaks of putting something in the mind. So this is instruction. This is building up their understanding of God and of God's word and how they're supposed to live and how they're supposed to relate to this world. This is giving them right patterns of behavior and thinking because, listen, because the television programs they're watching are giving them wrong patterns of thinking. And I'm going to sound like a legalist here, but I just feel led to do so. Parents, we need to know what our children are watching. Because the worldview and the philosophy that's being put through PBS and Disney and every other outlet we can have is anti-God. And we need to be careful. If they're getting 80 hours a week of television and two hours a week of the Bible, which one wins? Parents, we need to be careful to instruct our children so that they can think rightly so that they have a prayer of thinking rightly. I know that's a challenge in a busy, busy world, but you know what? Our children are going to live forever in heaven or they're going to live forever in hell. It's worth the effort. It's worth the effort. So putting it together, Paul's instructing fathers in particular to do what Jesus commanded his disciples to do. What did Jesus command his disciples to do in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20? It's make disciples. Make disciples of your children, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded them. That's what we're after. In his, in his book on parenting, Chap Bettis put it this way. He says, the foundational parenting text is not Ephesians 4, verses 1 to 4, or Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9, as important as they are. Rather, it is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Parents, if we want to raise our children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, we have to remember that our goal is not outward conformity. Our goal is not that they would be nice people. Our goal is not that they would be successful or overachievers. Our goal is that they would be disciples of Jesus Christ, that they would love him, that they would honor him, that they would follow him. Fathers, let me give you a special word here because this is interesting. Even secular sociologists, you know, they point to poll after poll after poll that points to the influence of the father on the life of the child as it relates to religion and God. Listen to what a 2011 Christian Post article had to say. Survey was taken. It said this, If a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful his wife's devotions may be, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. 
If a father does go regularly, regardless of the practice of the mother, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will become churchgoers, either regular or irregular. One of, the, one of the reasons suggested for this distinction is that children tend to take their cues about domestic life from mom while their conceptions of the world uh, outside come from dad. If dad takes faith in God seriously, then the message to their children is that God should be taken seriously. And those statistics are amazing to me. And I've seen something like that in my own life because I've seen many mothers trying so desperately to help their children follow Jesus and come and bring them to church and try to get them involved. And I've seen fathers just, you know, they show up from time to time. You know, just every once in a while. And all that they're doing, all that they're doing is they're tearing down everything their mother is trying to do for their children. One pastor put it this way, to give children good instruction and a bad example is but beckoning them with the head to show them the way to heaven while we take them by the hand and lead them in the way to hell. And I think that's right. So fathers, beware of telling your children to follow Jesus if you yourself are not willing to do so. You'll be doing massive damage. Instead, repent. Turn from selfishness and determine by God's grace that you are going to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus yourself and bring them along with you and consider how precious they are. Oh, so much better than a football game. So much more important than golf. So much better than work success. Let you just achieve everything, 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 and leave your kids behind. And when you come to die, friend, you'll regret it. Because your children may not be there. No, God gives us a good word. He gives us a good word when he tells us to discipline and to train up and to love and to nurture our children. So very briefly, let me ask just two questions that will help us do this. What will help you, what will help us make disciples of our children? Two words, time and love. Parenting takes time. More than seven hours a week. It's going to take more than, if we're going to do what Paul is commanding us to do here, it's going to take more than seven hours a week. Instead, it's going to become this lifestyle of investing in the children that God has entrusted to us. And you know what? That's for like 18 years, right, in our culture, and then they go off, and we have all this time on our own. But for 18 years, what do we have? We have the tremendous privilege of taking them along in ministry and teaching them how to pray and teaching them how to read the Bible and showing them what Bible memory looks like and pointing them towards Jesus over and over and over. What a privilege, but it's a privilege that costs time. Even more crucially, discipling our children, here's number two, it requires love. We have to truly love them. Some parents are continually stern with their children, always disciplining, always correcting, but think about it. Is that how you would want to be parented? Remember, we are to love our neighbors ourselves. We are to love our children as ourselves. And so some of that should impact the way we parent. Would you always want to be corrected? Would you always want to be chastised? Well, friend, then we can't do that to our children. They need life. They need life. They need air. They need encouragement. The major emphasis of our parenting should be on actively loving our children so that we might win their hearts. J.C. Ryle had a good word for parents. He said... Love should be the silver thread that runs through all your conduct. Kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, forbearance, patience, sympathy, a willingness to enter into childish troubles, a readiness to take part in childish joys. These are the cords by which a child may be led most easily. These are the clues you must follow if you would find the way to his heart. We need to love our children. Better than that, we need to love our children with God's love which means we need to ask him for the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, to be given to us in abundance so that when we're tired at the end of the day, we have more to give. We have more to share. Well, we begun the sermon this morning talking about how exhausting parenting can be, but we've also seen that this is a great privilege. What a tremendous blessing. What a tremendous privilege. You know, Josiah read for us from Psalm 127 that children are a heritage from the Lord The fruit of the womb is a reward. And here's the thing. Children are also mighty weapons. The Bible calls them arrows that God can use to accomplish his purposes in the world. And that should be our heart's desire for our children, that, that they would be treasures to us and that they would be arrows that God can use as he accomplishes his purpose in the world. And let me give you just one last word in conclusion. If you feel convicted by this this morning, you're in good company. 
And that's why we believe the gospel at this church. That's why we look to Jesus. Because he covers all of our failures and he gives us the strength we need today to repent of the way that we are failing to love our kids and by his grace taking the next step of obedience. And that's what we're called to. We can't do anything about the past. That's under the blood of Christ, praise God. What we can do is we can live today and each day here on out according to his word. And may God help us do it. May God help us do it. Let's pray. So God, we look at these words, and those of us who are parents, I know, we feel in our hearts in so many ways, Lord, we fail to parent our children in the way that you parent us. And for that, God, we ask your forgiveness, but we thank you this morning for the hope of the gospel that tells us to keep pressing on, keep pressing on. So strengthen us today, Lord, to love our children well, and I pray for our children. Lord, I pray for our children who sit here Sunday after Sunday and do not know you, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that today would be the day when little boys or little girls would come to a saving faith in Christ, and when teenagers decide that being Christian-y isn't enough, that they must be born again. And God, I pray that you do that work in our church by your Spirit, and I pray that you would do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask the musicians to come. We're going to respond to God's Word this morning with a song, a praise. It's a a great hymn that we have sung in the past. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand as the musicians come. Let us have time to get ready to lead you. say our benediction as we conclude the service this morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Use the next few moments to think about what you've heard this morning, and then the men are going to, or the usher.